A Description of New England by Captain John Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. A Description of New England by Captain John Smith. Section 0 Title Page and Dedications. A description of New England, or the observations and discoveries of Captain John Smith, Admiral of that country in the north of America, in the year of our Lord, 1614, with the success of six ships that went the next year, 1615, and the accidents befell him among the French men of war. With the proof of the present benefit this country affords, whether this present year, 1616, eight voluntary ships are gone to make further trial. At London, printed by Humphrey Lowndes for Robert Clerk, and are to be sold at his house called The Lodge in Chancery Lane, over against Lincoln's Inn, 1616. To the high hopeful Charles, Prince of Great Britain, Sir, so favourable was your most renowned and memorable brother, Prince Henry, to all generous designs, that in my discovery of Virginia I presumed to call two nameless headlands after my sovereign heirs, Cape Henry and Cape Charles. Since then, it being my chance, to range some other parts of America, whereof I here present your highness the description in a map. My humble suit is, you would please to change their barbarous names, for such English as posterity may say, Prince Charles was their godfather. What here in this relation I promise my country, let me live or die the slave of scorn and infamy, if, having meanness, I make not apparent. Please God to bless me, but for such accidents as are beyond my power and reason to prevent. For my labours I desire but such conditions as were promised me out to the gains, and that your highness would deign to grace this work, by your princely and favourable respect unto it, and to know me to be your highness true and faithful servant, John Smith. To the right honourable and worthy lords, knights, and gentlemen of his majesty's council for all plantations and discoveries, especially of New England. Seeing the deeds of the most just and the writings of the most wise, not only of men, but of God himself, have been diversely traduced by variable judgments of the time's opinionists, what shows its ignorant as I expect? Yet, reposing myself on your favours, I present this rude discourse to the world's construction. Though I am persuaded that few do think they may be had from New England steepled commodities well worth three or four hundred thousand pound a year, with so small a charge, on such facility as this discourse will acquaint you. But, lest your honours that know me not should think I go by hearsay or affection, I entreat your pardons to say this much of myself. Near twice nine years I have been taught by lamentable experience, as well in Europe and Asia, as Africa and America, such honest adventures as the chance of war doth cast upon poor soldiers. So that, if I not be able to judge of what I have seen, contrived, and done, it is not the fault either of my eyes or of four quarters. And these nine years I have bent my endeavours to find a sure foundation to begin these ensuing projects, which though I never so plainly and seriously propound, yet it resteth in God and you still to dispose of. Not doubting, but your goodness will pardon my rudeness, and ponder errors in the balance of good will. No more, 
perceiving all my best abilities to the good of my prince and country and submitting myself to the exquisite judgments of your renowned virtue i ever rest your honours in all honest service j s to the right worshipful adventurers for the country of new england in the cities of london bristow exeter plymouth dartmouth bustable tutneys etc and in all other cities and ports in the kingdom of england if the little aunt and the silly bee seek by their diligence the good of their commonwealth much more ought man if they punish the drones and sting them still as they labour then blame not man little honey hath that hive where there are more drones than bees and miserable is that land where more are idle than well employed if the endeavours of those vermin be acceptable i hope mine may be excusable though i confess it were more proper for me to be doing what i say than writing what i know had i returned rich i could not have erred now having only such fish as came to my net i must be taxed but i would my taxes were as ready to adventure their purses as i purse life and all i have or as diligent to furnish the charge as i know they are vigilant to crop the fruits of my labours then would i not doubt did god please i might safely arrive in new england and safely return but to perform somewhat more than i have promised and approve my words by deeds according to a proportion i am not the first hath been betrayed by pirates and four men of war provided as they were had been sufficient to have taken samson hercules and alexander the great no other way furnished than i was i know not what assurance any have to pass the seas not to be subject to casualty as well as myself but least this disaster may hinder my proceedings or ill will by rumour the hopeful work i pretend i have writ this little which i did think to have concealed from any public use until i had made my return speak as much as my pen now doth but because i speak so much of fishing if any take me for such a devout fisher as i dream of naught else they mistake me i know a ring of gold from a grain of barley as well as a goldsmith for well, nothing is there to be had which fishing doth hinder but further us to obtain now for that i have made known unto you a fit place for plantation limited within the bounds of your patent and commission having also received means power and authority by your directions to plant there a colony and make further search and discovery in those parts there as yet unknown considering withal first those of his majesty's council then those cities above named and diverse others that have been moved to lend their assistance to so great a work doth expect especially the adventurers the true lation nor event of my proceedings which i hear are so abused i am enforced for all these respects rather to expose my imbecility to contempt by the testimony of these rude lines than all should condemn me for so bad a factor as could neither give reason nor account of my actions and designs yours to command john smith end of section zero title page and dedication A description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section one, testimonial verses, opening set. In the deserved honour of the author, Captain John Smith and his work. Dumbed envy is a sprite that e'er haunts beasts, misnamed men, cowards, or ignorance, but only such she follows whose dear worth maugre her malice sets their glory forth if this fair overture then take not it is envy spite dear friend in men of wit or fear lest morsels which our mouths possess 
might fall from thence, or else tis sottishness, if either, I hope neither, thee they raise, thy letters are as letters in thy praise, who by their vice improve when they reprove thy virtue, so in hate procure thee love. Then on firm worth this monument I frame, scorning for any smith to forge such fame. Joe Davies, Hereford To his worthy captain, the author, That which we call the subject of all story is truth, which in this work of thine gives glory to all that thou hast done. Then scorn the spite of envy, which doth no man's merits right. My sword may help the rest, my pen no more can do, but this I have said enough before. Your sometimes soldier, I, Codrington, now Templar. To my worthy friend and cousin, Captain John Smith, it overjoys my heart, when as thy words of these designers with deeds I do compare. Here is a book, such worthy truth affords, none should the Jew desert thereof impair, sith thou, the man, deserving of these ages, much pain hath ta'en for this thou kingdom's good. In climes unknown, mongst Turks and salvages, tin larger bounds, though with thy loss of blood, Hence, damned attraction, stand not in our way, and we, itself, will not the truth gain a say. N. Smith To that worthy and general gentleman, my very good friend, Captain Smith, May fate thy project prosper, that thy name may be eternized with living fame, Though foul detraction honour would pervert, and envy ever waits upon desert. In spite of Peleus, when his heat lays cold, Return as Jason with a fleece of gold. Then, after ages, shall record thy praise, That a new England to this isle didst raise. And when thou diest, as all that live must die, Thy fame live here, thou with eternity. Our Gunnel to his friend Captain Smith, upon his description of New England. Sir, your relations I have read, would show there is reason I should honour them and you, and if their meaning I have understood, I dare to censure thus, your project's good, and may, if followed, doubtless quit the pain with honour, pleasure, and a treble gain beside the benefit that shall arise to make more happy our posterities. For would we deign to spare, though it were no more than what o'er fills and surfeits us in store, to order nature's fruitfulness a while in that rude garden you New England style? With present good there is hope in after days thence to repair what time and pride decays in this rich kingdom. And the spatious west, being still more with English blood possessed, the proud Iberian shall not rule those seas to check our ships from sailing where they please. Nor future times make any foreign power become so great to force the bound to our. Much good my mind foretells would follow hence with little labour and with less expense. Thrive therefore thy design, who e'er envy. England may joy in England's colony, Virginia seek her virgin sister's good, be blessed in such happy neighbourhood, or whatsoe'er fate pleaseth to permit, be thou still honoured for first moving it. George Wither, Associate at Lincoln In the desert honour of my honest and worthy captain, John Smith, and his work, Captain and friends, when I peruse thy book, With judgment's eyes into thy heart I look, And there I find what sometimes Albion knew, A soldier to his country's honour true. Some fight for wealth, and some for empty praise, But thou alone thy country's fame to raise. With you discretion and undaunted heart, 
I oft so well have seen the act thy part in deepest plunge of hard extremity as forced the troops of proudest foes to flee though men of greater rank and less desert would pish away thy praise it cannot start from the true owner for old good men's tongue shall keep the same to them that part belongs if then wit courage and success should get thee fame the muse for that is in thy debt a part whereof least able though i be thus here i do disperse to honour thee Raleigh Crusher Michael Fetty Place, William Fetty Place, and Richard Whiffing, gentlemen and soldiers under Captain Smith's command, in his deserved honour for his work and worth. Why may not we in this work have our might, that had our share in each black day and night, when thou Virginia foilst, yet kept unstained, and hiltst the king of Paspehech? enchained thou all alone the salvage stern did take palmunkus king we saw thee captive make among seven hundred of his stoutest men to murther thee and us resolved when fast by the hand thou ledst this salvage grim thy pistol at his breast to govern him which did infuse such awe in all the rest sith their dread sovereign thou hast so distressed that thou and we poor sixteen safe retired unto our helpless ships though thus admired did make proud poetan his subjects send to james this tone thy censure to attend and all virginia's lords and petty kings awed by thy virtue crouch and presence brings to gain thy grace so dreaded thou hast been and yet a heart more mild is seldom seen so making valour virtue rarely who has naught in thee counterfeit or sly if in the slight be not the truest art that makes men for most for fair desert who saith of thee this savours on vain glory mistakes both thee and us and this true story if it be ill in thee so well to do then is it ill in us to praise thee too but if the first be well done it is well to say it doth if so it doth excel praise is a garden of such dear desert making the praised act the praised part with more alacrity honour's spare is praise without which it regardless soon decays and for this pains of thine we praise thee rather that future times may know who was the father of this rare work new england which may bring praise to thy God and profit to thy King. End of section one. Testimonial verses. Opening set. Section two of a description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Algie Pug. Section 2. A Description of New England, Part 1. The Description of New England by Captain John Smith. My first two voyages to New England. In the month of April, 1614, with two ships from London of a few merchants, I happened to arrive in New England, a part of America, at the Isle of Monabigan, in the forty-third and a half of northerly latitude. Our oh, plot was there to take whales, and to make trials of a mine of gold and copper. If those failed, fish and furs was then our refuge, to make ourselves save as howsoever. We found this whale-fishing a costly conclusion. We saw many, and spent much time in chasing them, but could not kill any. They be a kind of jubartes, and not the whale that yieldeth finis and oil as we expected. For our gold, it was rather the master's device to get a voyage that projected it, than any knowledge he had at all of any such matter. Fish and furs was now our guard. And, by our late arrival, 
and long lingering about the whale the prime of both those seasons were past ere we perceived it we thinking that their season served at all times but we found it otherwise for by the midst of june the fishing failed yet in july and august some was taken but not sufficient to defray so great a charge as our stay required of dry fish we made about forty thousand of core fish about seven thousand whilst the sailors fished myself with eight or nine others of them might best be spared ranging a coast in a small boat we got for trifles near eleven hundred beaver skinners a hundred martens and nearer as many otters and the most of them within a distance of twenty leagues we ranged the coast both east and west much further but eastwards our commodities were not esteemed they were so near the french who afford them better and right against us in the main was a ship of sir francis Pophamus, that had there such acquaintance having many years used only that port that the most part there was had by him on the forty leagues westward were two french ships that had made there a great voyage by trade during the time we tried those conclusions not knowing the coast or salvage's habitation with these furs the train and the corfish we returned for england in the barrack where within six months after our departure from the downs we see arrived back the best of this fish was sold for five pound the hundredth the rest by ill usage betwixt three pound and fifty shillings the other ship stayed to fit herself for spain with the dry fish that was sold by the sailors report that returned at forty riles the quintal each hundred weighing two quintals and a half the situation of new england new england is that part of america in the ocean sea opposite to nova albion in the south sea discovered by the most memorable sir francis drake in his voyage about the world in regard whereto this is styled new england being in the same latitude new france off it is northward southwards is virginia and all the adjoining continent with new granada new spain new andalusia and the west indies no because i have been so oft asked such strange questions of the goodness and greatness of those spacious tracts of land how they can be thus long unknown or nor possessed by the spaniard and many such like demands i entreat your pardons if i chance to be too plain or tedious in relating my knowledge for plain men's satisfaction notes of florida florida is the next adjoining to the indies which unprosperously was attempted to be planted by the french a country far bigger than england scotland france and ireland yet little known to any christian but by the wonderful endeavours of ferdinand de soto a valiant spaniard whose writings in this age is the best guide known to search those parts notes of virginia virginia is no isle as many do imagine but part of the continent adjoining to florida whose bounds may be stretched to the magnitude thereof without offence to any christian inhabitant for from the degrees of thirty to forty-five his majesty hath granted his letters patents the coast extending south-west and north-east about fifteen hundred miles but to follow it aboard the shore may well be two thousand at the least of which twenty miles is the most gives entrance into the bay of chesapeake where is the london plantation within which is a country as you may perceive by the description in a book and map printed in my name of that little i there discovered may well suffice three hundred thousand people to inhabit and southward adjoineth that part discovered at the charge of sir walter raleigh by sir ralph lane and that learned mathematician mr thomas harriot northward six or seven degrees is the river sagadabok where was planted the western colony by that honourable patron of virtue sir john popham 
Lord Chief Justice of England. There is also a relation printed by Captain Bartholomew Gosnold of Elizabeth's Isles, and an other by Captain Weymouth of the Pemaquid. From all these diligent observers, posterity may be bettered by the fruits of their labours. But for divers others, that long before and since have ranged those parts, within a kenning sometimes of the shore, some touching in one place, some in another, I must entreat them pardon for omitting them. For if I offend in saying that their true descriptions are concealed, or never well observed, or died with the authors, so that the coast is yet still, but even as a coast unknown and undiscovered. I have had six or seven several plots of those northern parts, so unlike each to other, and most so differing from any true proportion or resemblance of the country, as they did me no more good than was so much waste paper, though they cost me more. It may be it was not my chance to see the best, but least others may be deceived as I was, or through dangerous ignorance hazard themselves as I did. I have drawn a map from point to point, isle to isle, and harbour to harbour, with the soundings, suns, rocks, and landmarks as I pass close aboard the shore in a little boat, although there be many things to be observed which the haste of other affairs did cause me omit. For, being sent more to get present commodities than knowledge by discoveries for any future good, I had not power to such as I would yet it will serve to direct any shall go that ways to safe harbours and the salvages habitations what merchandise and commodities for their labour they may find this following discourse shall plainly demonstrate thus you may see of this two thousand miles more than half is yet unknown to any purpose no not so much as the borders of the sea are yet certainly discovered as for the goodness and true substance of the land, we are for the most part yet altogether ignorant of them, unless it be those parts about the Bay of Chesapeake and Sagadabok, but only here and there we touched, or have seen a little those edges of those large dominions which do stretch themselves into the main. God doth know how many thousand miles whereof we can yet no more judge than a stranger that saileth betwixt England and France can describe the harbours and dangers by landing here and there in some river or bay, till thereby the goodness and substances of Spain, Italy, Germany, Bohemia, Hungary, and the rest. By this you may perceive how much they err that think every one which hath been at Virginia understandeth or knows what Virginia is, or that the Spaniards know one half quarter of those territories they possess. No, not so much as the true circumference of the terra incognita, whose large dominions may equalize the greatness and goodness of America, for anything yet known. It is strange with what small power he hath reigned in the East Indies, and few will understand the truth of his strength in America, where he, having so much to keep with such a pampered force, they need not greatly fear his fury in the Bermudas, Virginia, New France, or New England, beyond whose bounds America doth stretch many thousand miles, in the frozen parts whereof one master Hudson, an English mariner, did make the greatest discoveries of any Christian I can know of, where he unfortunately died. For Africa, had not the industrious Portugalis ranged her unknown parts, who would have sought for wealth among those fried regions of black, brutish nagers, where, notwithstanding all the wealth and admirable adventures and endeavours more than a hundred and forty years, they know not one-third of those black habitations. But it is not a work for every one to manage such an affair as makes a discovery and plants a colony." It requires all the best parts of art, judgment, courage, honesty, constancy, diligence, and industry to do but near well. Some are more proper for one thing than another, 
and therein are to be employed, and nothing breeds more confusion than misplacing and misemploying men in their undertakings. Columbus, Cortez, Pizarra, Soto, Magellanus, and the rest serve more than apprenticeship to learn how to begin their most memorable attempts in the West Indies, which, to the wonder of all ages, successfully they effected, when many hundreds of others far above them in the world's opinion, being instructed but by relation, came to shame and confusion in actions of small moment, who oh, doubtless in other matters were both wise, discreet, generous, and courageous. I say not this to detract anything from their incomparable merits, but to answer those questionless questions that keep us back from imitating the worthiness of their brave spirits that advance themselves from poor soldiers to great captains, their posterity to great lords, their king to be one of the greatest potentates on earth, and the fruits of their labours his greatest glory, power, and renown. The description of New England that part we call New England is betwixt the degrees of forty-one and forty-five. But that part this discourse speaketh of stretcheth but from Penobscot to Cape Cod, some seventy-five leagues by a right line distant each from other, within which bounds I have seen at least forty several habitations upon the sea coast, and sounded about twenty-five excellent good harbours in many whereof there is anchorage for five hundred sail of ships of any burthen, in some of them for five thousand, and more than two hundred isles overgrown with good timber of divers sorts of wood, which do make so many harbours as requireth a longer time than I had to be well discovered. The Particular Countries or Governments The principal habitation northward we were at was Penobscot. Southward, along the coast, and up the rivers, we found Megadakut, Segocket, Pemaquid, Nusconcus, Kennebec, Sagadahok, and Aumokogin. And to those countries belong the people of Segatago, Paghuntanuk, Pocopassum, Taukanakinect, Wabiganus, Nasak, Mashirosquek, Warigwek, Mosokwen, Wakogo, Pasaranak, etc. To these are alloyed the countries of Aukosisko, Akomintikus, Pasataquak, Agawon, and Namekek. All these, I could perceive, differ little in language, fashion, or government. Though most be lords of themselves, yet they hold the Bashabis of Penobscot the chief and greatest amongst them. The next we can remember by name are Matahunts, two pleasant isles of groves, gardens, and cornfields in league from the sea from the main. Then Totunt, Massachusett, Pokapomet, Quonahasset, Sagoquas, Nahapasumquek, Topint, Sekasor, Totit, Nasnokomakak, Akomak, Chowum. Then Cape Cod, by which is Pomet and the Isle Norset of the language and alliance of them of Chom. The others are called Massachusetts of another language, humour and condition. For their trade and merchandise, to each of their habitations they have diverse towns and people belonging, and by their relations and descriptions more than twenty several habitations and rivers that stretched themselves far up into the country, even to the borders of diverse great lakes, where they kill and take most of their beavers and otters. From Penobscot to Saga da Hoch, this coast is all mountains and isles of huge rocks, but overgrown with all sorts of excellent good woods for building houses, boats, barks, or ships, with an incredible abundance of most sorts of fish, much fowl, and sundry sorts of good fruits for man's use. The mixture of an excellent soil. Betwixt Sagadohok and Soakatuk there is but two or three sandy bays, but betwixt that and Cape Cod very many, 
especially the coast of the Massachusetts, is so indifferently mixed with high clay or sandy cliffs in one place, and then tracts of large, long ledges of divers sorts, and quarries of stones in other places, so strangely divided, with tinctured veins of divers colours, as free stone for building, slate for tailing, smooth stone to make furnaces and forges for glass or iron, and iron ore sufficient conveniently to melt in them. But the most part so resembleth the coast of Devonshire, I think most of the cliffs would make such limestone. If they be not of these qualities, they are so like, they may deceive a better judgment than mine." all which are so near adjoining those other advantages I observed in those parts, that if the ore prove as good iron and steel in those parts, as I know it is within the bounds of the country, I dare engage my heed, having but men skilful to work the simplers they are growing, to have all things belonging to the building and the rigging of ships of any proportion, and good merchandise for the fraught, within a square of ten or fourteen leagues, and were it for a good reward, I would not fear to prove it in a less limitation. A proof of an excellent temper, a proof of health, and surely, by reason of those sandy cliffs and cliffs of rocks, both which we saw are so planted with gardens and cornfields, and so well inhabited with a goodly, strong, and well-proportioned people, besides the greatness of the timber growing on them, the greatness of the fish, and the moderate temper of the air, for of twenty-five not any were sick, but two that were many years diseased before they went, notwithstanding our bad lodging and accidental diet. Who can but approve this a most excellent place, both for health and fertility? and of all the four parts of the world that I have yet seen not inhabited, could I have but means to transport a colony, I would rather live here than anywhere, and if it did not maintain itself, were we but indifferently well fitted, let us starve. Steeple Commodities Present The main steeple, from hence to be extracted for the present to produce the rest, is fish, which, however, it may seem a mean and base commodity, yet who will but truly take the pains and consider the sequel, I think, will allow it well worth the labour. It is strange to see what great adventures the hopes of setting forth men of war to rob the industrious innocent would procure, or such massy promises in gross, no more a choke then well fed with such hasty hopes. The Hollanders fishing. But who doth not know that the poor Hollanders, chiefly by fishing, had a great charge and labour in all weathers in the open sea, and made a people so hardy and industrious, and by the venting this poor commodity to the Easterlings for as mean, which is wood, flax, pitch, tar, rosin, cordage, and such like, for which they exchange again to the French, Spaniards, Portugalis and English, etc., for what they want, are made so mighty, strong, and rich, as no state but Venice, of twice their magnitude, is so well furnished with so many fair cities, goodly towns, strong fortresses, and that abundance of shipping, and all sorts of merchandise, as well of gold, silver, pearls, diamonds, precious stones, silks, velvets, and cloth of gold, as fish, pitch, wood, or such gross commodities. What voyages and discoveries, east and west, north and south, ye about the world make they? What an army by sea and land have they long maintained in despite of one of the greatest princes of the world? And never could the Spaniard with all his mines of gold and silver pay his debts, his friends and army, half so truly as the Hollanders still have done by this contemptible trade of fish. Divers, I know, may allege many other assistances, but this is their mine, and the sea the source of those silvered streams of all their virtue, 
which hath made them now the very miracle of industry, the pattern of perfection for these affairs. And the benefit of fishing is that primum mobile which turns all their spheres to this height of plenty, strength, honour, and admiration, which is fifteen hundred pound. Heading, cod, and ling is that triplicity which makes their wealth and shipping's multiplicities, such as it is, and from which, few would think it, they yearly draw at least half a million and a half of pounds sterling. Yet it is most certain, if records be true, and in this faculty they are so naturalized, and of their events so certainly acquainted, as there is no likelihood they will ever be paralleled, having two or three thousand bushes, flat bottoms, sword pinks, toads, and such like, that breeds them sealers, mariners, soldiers, and merchants, never to be wrought out of that trade, and fit for any other. I will not deny, but others may gain as well as they, that will use it, though not so certainly, nor so much in quantity, for want of experience. And this herring they take upon the coast of Scotland and England, their cod and ling upon the coast of Ireland and in the North Seas. Hambra on the east countries, for sturgeon and caviar, gets many thousands of pounds from England, and the Straits, Portugale, the Biscaynes, and the Spaniards make forty or fifty sailor yearly to Cape Blanc to hook for porgos, mullet, and make putado. A new found land doth yearly float near eight hundred sail of ships with a silly, lean, skinny poor John and corfish, which at least yearly amounts to three or four hundred thousand pound. If from all those parts such pains is taken for this poor gains of fish, and by them hath neither meat, drink, nor clothes, wood, iron, nor steel, pitch, tar, nets leads, salt, hooks, nor lines, for shipping, fishing, nor provision, but at the second, third, fourth, or fifth hand, drawn from so many several parts of the world ere they come together to be used in this voyage. If these, I say, can gain, and the sailors live going for shares, less than the third part of their labours, yet spend as much time in going and coming as in staying there, so short is the season of fishing. Why should not we more doubt than Holland, Portugale, Spaniard, French, or other, but to do much better than they, when there is victual to feed us, wood of all sorts, to build boats, ships, or barks, the fish at our doors, pitch, tar, masts, yards, and most of the other necessities only for making. And here are no hard landlords to rack us with high rents, or extorted fines to consume us, no tedious pleas in law to consume us with their many years' disputations for justice, no multitudes to occasion such impediments to good orders as in populous states. So freely hath God and his majesty bestowed those blessings on them that will attempt to obtain them, as here every man may be master and owner of his own labour and land, or the greatest part in a small time. If he have nothing but his hands, he may set up this trade, and by industry quickly grow rich, spending but half that time well, which in England we abuse in idleness, worse or as ill. Here is ground almost as good as any lieth in the height of forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, etc., which is as temperate and as fruitful as any other parallel in the world. Examples of the altitude comparatively. As, for example, on this side the line west of it in the South Sea is Nova Albion, discovered, as is said, by Sir Francis Drake, East from it is the most temperate part of Portugal, the ancient kingdoms of Galatia, Biscay, Navarre, Aragon, Catalonia, Castilla, the old, and the most moderatest of Castilla, the new, and Valencia, which is the greatest part of Spain, 
which if the Spanish histories be true, in the Romans' time abounded no less with gold and silver mines than now the West Indies, the Romans then using the Spaniards to work in those mines, as now the Spaniards doth the Indians. End of section 2 A description of New England by Captain John Smith, part 1「Three of a description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three A description of New England Part two And France, the provinces of Gascony, Languedoc, Avignon, Provence, Dauphine, Piemont, and Turin are in the same parallel which are the best and richest parts of france in italy the provinces of genoa lombardy and verona with a great part of the most famous state of venice the dukedoms of bononia mantua ferrara ravenna bologna florence pisa siena urbine ancona and the ancient city and country of Rome, with a great part of the great kingdom of Naples, in Slavonia, Istria, and Dalmatia, with the kingdoms of Albania, in Gratia, that famous kingdom of Macedonia, Bulgaria, Thessalia, Thracia, or Romania, where is seated the most pleasant and plentiful city in Europe, Constantinople. In Asia also, in the same latitude, are the temperatest parts of Natolia, Armenia, Persia, and China, besides divers other large countries and kingdoms in these most mild and temperate regions of Asia. Southward, in the same height, is the richest of gold mines, Chile and Baldivia on the mouth of the great river of Plate, etc. For all the rest of the world in that height is yet unknown. Besides these reasons, mine own eyes that have seen a great part of those cities and their kingdoms, as well as it, can find no advantage they have in nature but this. They are beautified by the long labour and diligence of industrious people and art, this is only as God made it when he created the world. Therefore, I conclude, if the heart and intrals of those regions were sought, if their land were cultured, planted, and manured by men of industry, judgment, and experience, what hope is there, or what need they dote, having these advantages of the sea, but it might equalize any of those famous kingdoms in all commodities, pleasures, and conditions. Seeing even the very edges do naturally afford us such plenty as no ship need return away empty, and only use but the season of the sea, fish will return an honest gain, beside all other advantages, her treasures having yet never been opened, nor her originals wasted, consumed, nor abused. The particular staple commodities that may be had. And, whereas it is said, the Hollanders serve the Easterlings themselves, and other parts that want, with herring, ling, and wet cod, the Easterlings, a great part of Europe, with strogeon and caviar, keep Blanc, Spain, Portugale, and the Levant, with mullet, and Putargo, Newfoundland, all Europe, with a thin poor John, yet all is so overlaid with fishers, as the fishing decayeth, and many are constrained to return with a small fruit. Norway, and Polonia, pitch, tar, masts, and yards, Sweatland, and Russia, iron, and ropes, France and Spain, canoes, wine, steel, iron, and oil, 
Italy and Greece, silks and fruits, I dare boldly say, because I have seen naturally growing or breeding in those parts the same materials that all those are made of, they may as well be had here, or the most part of them, within the distance of seventy leagues for some few ages, as from all those parts, using but the same means to have them that they do, and with all those advantages. The nature of ground approved. First, the ground is so fertile that questionless it is capable of producing any grain, fruits, or seed you will sow or plant, growing in the regions aforenamed, but it may be not every kind to that perfection of delicacy, or some tender plants may miscarry, because the summer is not so hot and the winter more cold in those parts we have yet tried near the seaside, then we find in the same height in Europe or Asia. Yet I made a garden upon the top of a rocky isle in forty-three and a half, four leagues from the main, in May, that grew so well as it served us for salads in June and July. All sorts of cattle may here be bred and fed in the isles, or peninsulas, securely for nothing. In the interim, to lay increase, if need be, observing the seasons, I durst undertake to have corn enough from the salvages for three hundred men for a few trifles, and if they should be untoward, as it is most certain they are, thirty or forty good men will be sufficient to bring them all into subjection, and make this provision, if they understand what they do, two hundred whereof may nine months in the year be employed in making marchionable fish, till the rest provide other necessaries, fit to furnish us with other commodities. The seasons for fishing are proved. In March, April, May, and half June, here is cod in abundance. In May, June, July, and August, mullet and sturgeon, whose rows do make caviar and putargo. Herring, if any desire them, I have taken many out of the bellies of cods, some in nets. But the salvages compare their store in the sea to the hairs of their heads and surely there are an incredible abundance upon this coast. In the end of August, September, October, and November, you have cod again to make core fish or poor john, and each hundred is as good as two or three hundred in the new found land, so that half the labour in hooking, splitting, and turning is saved, and you may have your fish at what market you will, before they can have any in new found land, where their fishing is chiefly but in June and July, whereas it is here in March, April, May, September, October, and November, as is said, so that by reason of this plantation the merchants may have fraught both out and home, which yields an advantage worth consideration. Your core fish you may in like manner transport as you see cause to serve the ports in Portugale, as Lisbon, Aura, Porta Port, and divers others, or what market you please, before your islanders return, they being tied to the season in the open sea, you having a double season, and fishing before your doors, may every night sleep quietly ashore, with good cheer, and what fires you will, or oh, when you please, with your wives and family, they only, their ships in the main ocean. The mullets here are in that abundance. You may take them with nets, sometimes by hundreds, where at Cape Blanc they hook them, yet those but one foot and a half in length, these two, three, or four, as oft I have measured. Much salmon some have found up the rivers, as they have passed. Here the air is so temperate, 
as all these at any time may well be preserved. Employment for poor people and fatherless children. Now young boys and girlish salvages, or any other, be they never such idlers, may turn, carry, and return fish, without either shame nor any great pain. He is very idle that is past twelve years of age and cannot do so much, and she is very old that cannot spin a thread to make engines to catch them. The Facility of the Plantation For their transportation, the ships that go there to fish may transport the first, who for their passage will spare the charge of double manning their ships, which they must do in the new found land, to get their fraught. But one third part of that company are only but proper to serve a stage, carry a barrow, and turn poor John. Notwithstanding, they must have meat, drink, clothes, and passage, as well as the rest. Now all I desire is but this, that those that voluntarily will send their shipping should make here the best choice they can or except such as are presented them to serve them at that rate and their ships returning leave such with me with the value of that they should receive coming home in such provisions and necessary tools arms bedding and apparel salt hooks nets lines and such like as they spare of the remainings who till the next return may keep their boats and do them many other profitable offices provided i have been of ability to teach them their functions and a company fit for soldiers to be ready upon such an occasion because of the abuses which have been offered the poor salvages and the liberty both french or any that will hath to deal with them as they please whose disorders will be hard to reform and the longer the worse no such order with facility might be taken with every port town or city to observe but this order with free power to convert the benefits of their fruits to what advantage they please and increase their numbers as they see occasion who ever as they are able to subsist of themselves may begin the new towns in new england in memory of their old which freedom being confined but to the necessity of the general good the event with god's help might produce an honest noble and a profitable emulation present commodities salt upon salt may assuredly be made if not at the first in ponds yet till they be provided this may be used then the ships may transport kine horse goats coarse cloth and such commodities as we want by whose arrival may be made that provision of fish to fraught the ships that they stay not and then if the sailors go for wages it matters not it is hard if this return to free not the charge but care must be had they arrive in the spring or else provision be made for them against the winter of certain red berries called alkermes which is worth ten shillings a pound but of these hath been sold for thirty or forty shillings the pound may yearly be gathered a good quantity of the muskrat may be well raised gains well worth their labour that will endeavour to make trial of their goodness of beavers otters martins black foxes and furs of price may yearly be had six of seven thousand and if the trade of the french were prevented many more twenty-five thousand this year were brought from those northern parts into france of which trade we may have as good part as the french if we take good courses of mines of gold and silver copper and probabilities of lead crystal and alum i could say much if relations were good assurances it is true indeed 
I have made many trials according to those instructions I had, which do persuade me I need not despair, but there are metals in the country. But I am no alchemist, nor will promise more than I know, which is, who will undertake the rectifying of an iron forge, if those that buy meat, drink, coals, or, and all necessaries had a dear rate gain. Where all these things are to be had for the taking up, in my opinion, cannot lose. Of woods, seeing there is plenty of all sorts, if those that build ships and boats buy wood at so great a price as it is in England, Spain, France, Italy, and Holland, and all other provisions for the nourishing of man's life, live well by their trade, when labour is all required to take those necessaries without any other tax. What hazard will be here, but do much better? And what commodity in Europe doth more decay than wood? For the goodness of the ground, let us take it fertile, or barren, or as it is, seeing it is certain it bears fruits, to nourish and feed man and beast, as well as England, and the sea those several sorts of fish I have related. Thus seeing all good provisions for man's sustenance may with this facility be had, by a little extraordinary labour, till that transported be increased, and all necessaries for shipping only for labour, to which may be added the assistance of the salvages, which may easily be had if they be discreetly handled in their kinds, towards fishing, planting, and destroying woods. What gains might be raised if this were followed, when there is but once men to fill your storehouses, dwelling there, you may serve all Europe better and far cheaper than can the island fishers, or the Hollanders, Cape Blanc, or Newfoundland, who must be at as much more charge than you, may easily be conjectured by this example. An example of the gains upon every year or six months return. Two thousand pound will fit out a ship of two hundred and one of a hundred tons, if the dry fish they both make fraught that of two hundred, and go for Spain, sell it put at ten shillings a quintal, but commonly it giveth fifteen or twenty, especially when it cometh first, which amounts to three or four thousand pound, but see but ten, which is the lowest, allowing the rest for waste, it amounts at that rate to two thousand pound, which is the whole charge of your two ships and their equipage. Then the return of the money, and the fraught of the ship for the vintage, or any other voyage, is clear gain, with your ship of a hundred tons of train and oil, besides the beavers and other commodities. On that you may have at home within six months, if God please but to send an ordinary passage. Then saving half this charge by the not staying of your ships, your victuals, over plus of men and wages, with her fraught thither of things necessary for the planters, the salt being there made, as also may the nets and lines within a short time. If nothing were to be expected but this, it might in time equalize your Hollanders' gains, if not exceed them, they returning but wood, pitch, tar, and such gross commodities, you, wines, oils, fruits, silks, and such straits commodities, as you please to provide by your factors, against such times as your ships arrive with them. This would so increase our shipping and sailors, and so employ and encourage a great part of our idlers and others that want employments fitting their qualities at home, with a shame to do that they would do abroad that could they but once taste the sweet fruits of their own labours, doubtless many thousands would be advised by good discipline to take more pleasure in honest industry than in their humours of dissolute idleness. 
a description of the countries in particular and their situations but to return a little more to the particulars of this country which i intermingle thus with my projects and reasons not being so sufficiently yet acquainted in those parts to write fully the estate of the sea the air the land the fruits the rocks the people the government religion territories and limitations friends and foes but as i gathered from the niggardly relations in a broken language to my understanding during the time i ranged those countries etc the most northern part i was at was the bay of penobscot which is east and west north and south more than ten leagues but such were my occasions i was constrained to be satisfied of them i found in the bay that the river ran far up into the land and was well inhabited with many people but they were from their habitations either fishing among the isles or hunting the lakes and woods for deer and beavers the bay is full of great islands of one two six eight or ten miles in length which divides it into many fair and excellent good harbours on the east of it are the tarentines their mortal enemies where inhabit the french as they report that live with those people as one nation or family and northwest of penobscot is mecca dacut at the foot of a high mountain a kind of fortress against the tarentines adjoining to the high mountains of penobscot against whose feet doth beat the sea but over all the land isles and other impediments you may well see them sixteen or eighteen leagues from their situation sagokit is the next then nusconcus pemmaquid and sagadahoc up this river where was the western plantation a uh, almukorgan kinebec and divers others where there is planted some cornfields along this river of forty or fifty miles i saw nothing but great high cliffs of barren rocks overgrown with wood but where the salvages dwelt there the ground is exceeding fat and fertile westward of this river is the country of alcosisco in the bottom of a large deep bay full of many great isles which divides it into many good harbours so katuk is the next in the edge of a large sandy bay which hath many rocks and isles but few good harbours but for barks i yet know but all of this coast to penobscot and as far as i could see eastward of it is nothing but such high craggy cliffy rocks and stony isles that i wondered such great trees could grow upon such hard foundations it is a country rather to affright than delight one and who to describe a more plain spectacle of desolation or more barren i know not yet the sea there is the strangest fish-pond i ever saw and those barren isles so furnished with good woods springs fruits fish and fowl that it makes me think though the coast be rocky and thus affrightable the valleys plains and interior parts may well notwithstanding be very fertile but there is no kingdom so fertile hath not some part barren a new england is great enough to make many kingdoms and countries were it all inhabited as you pass the coast still westward acominticus and passataquac are two convenient harbours for small barks and a good country within their craggy cliffs Ungoam is the next this place may content a right curious judgment but there are many sons at the entrance of the harbour and the worst is it is indeed too far from the deep sea here are many rising hills and on their tops and descents many cornfields and delightful groves on the east is an isle of two or three leagues in length the one half plain moorish grass fit for pasture with many fair high groves of mulberry trees gardens and there is also oaks 
pines and other woods to make this place an excellent habitation being a good and safe harbour name kick though it be more rocky ground for angoam is sandy not much inferior neither for the harbour nor anything i could perceive but the multitude of people from hence doth stretch into the sea the fair headland Trugabigzanda, fronted with three isles called the three turks heads to the north of this doth enter a great bay where we found some habitations and cornfields they report a great river and at least thirty habitations do possess this country but because the french had got their trade i had no leisure to discover it the isles of matahunts are on the west side of this bay where are many isles and questionless good harbours and then the country of the massachusetts which is the paradise of all those parts for here are many isles all planted with corn groves mulberries salvage gardens and good harbours the coast is for the most part high clay sandy cliffs the sea coast as you pass shows you all along large cornfields and great troops of well proportioned people but the french having remained here near six weeks left nothing for us to take occasion to examine the inhabitants relations viz if there be near three thousand people upon these isles and that the river doth pierce many days journeys the intervals of that country we found the people in those parts very kind but in their fury no less valiant for upon a quarrel we had with one of them he only with three others crossed the harbour of quanahasset to certain rocks whereby we must pass and there let fry their arrows for our shot till we were out of danger then come you to akomak an excellent good harbour good land and no want of anything but industrious people after much kindness upon a small occasion we fought also with forty or fifty of those though some were hurt and some slain yet within an hour after they became friends cape cod is the next it presents itself which is only a headland of high hills of sand overgrown with shrubby pines hurts and such trash but an excellent harbour for all weathers this cape is made by the main sea on the one side and a great bay on the other in form of a sickle on it doth inhabit the people of Pormet, and in the bottom of the bay the people of chom towards the south and south-west of this cape is found a long and dangerous shoal of sands and rocks but so far as i encircled it i found thirty fathom water aboard the shore and a strong current which makes me think there is a channel about this shoal where is the best and greatest fish to be had winter and summer in all that country but as the salvages say there is no channel but that the shoals begin from the main at pormet to the isle of nausit and so extends beyond their knowledge into the sea the next to this is kapawak and those abounding countries of copper corn people and minerals which i went to discover this last year but because i miscarried by the way i will leave them to god please i have better acquaintance with them end of section three a description of new england part two recording by algy pug Section four of a description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section four A Description of New England Part three A Good Country The Massachusetts, they report, sometimes have wars with the Bashabis of Penobscot and are not always friends with them of chawam and their alliance but now they are old friends 
and have each trade with other so far as they have society on each other's frontiers for they make no such voyages as from penobscot to cape cod seldom to massachusetts in the north as i have said they begin to plant corn whereof the south part hath such plenty as they have what they will from them of the north and in the winter much more plenty of fish and fowl but both winter and summer hath it in one part or other all the year being the mean and most indifferent temper betwixt heat and cold of all the regions betwixt the line and the pole but the firs northward are much better and in much more plenty than southward the landmarks the remarkablest isles and mountains for landmarks are these the highest isle is sodico in the bay of penobscot but the three isles and the rock of matinac are much further in the sea matinicus is also three plain isles and a rock betwixt it and monahegan monahegan is a round high isle and close by it monanis betwixt which is a small harbour where we ride in damarill's isles is such another sagadahok is known by satquin and four or five isles in the mouth smith's isles are a heap together none near them against acominticus the three turks heads are three isles seen far to seaward in regard of the headland the chief headlands are only cape tragabigzanda and cape cod herbs the chief mountains them of penobscot the twinkling mountain of aucosisco the great mountain of sassanon and the high mountains of massachusetts each of which you shall find in the map the places forms and altitude the waters of the most pure proceeding from the entrails of rocky mountains the herbs and fruits are of many sorts and kinds as are kermes currants or a fruit like currants mulberries vines respices gooseberries plums walnuts chestnuts small nuts etc pumpions gourds strawberries beans peas and maize and a kind or two of flax wherewith they make nets lines and ropes both small and great very strong for their quantity woods oak is the chief wood of which there is great difference in regard to the soil where it groweth fir pine walnut chestnut birch ash elm cypress cedar mulberry plum tree hazel saxifrage and many other sorts birds eagles grapes diverse sorts of hawks cranes geese brants cormorants ducks sheldrakes teal mewers gulls turkeys dive droppers and many other sorts whose names i know not fishers whales grampus porpoises turbot sturgeon cod hake haddock coal cusk or small ling shark mackerel herring mullet bass pinax cunas perch eels crabs lobsters muscles wilkes oysters and diverse others etc beasts moose a beast bigger than a stag deer red and fallow beavers wolves foxes both black and other a rough cones wild cats bears otters martens fitches musquesus and diverse sorts of vermin whose names i know not all these and diverse other good things do here for want of use still increase and decrease with little diminution whereby they grow to that abundance you shall scarce find any bay shallow shore 
or cove of sand where you may not take many clumps or lobsters or both at your pleasure and in many places load your boat if you please nor isles where you find not fruits birds crabs and muscles or all of them for taking at a low water and in the harbours we frequented a little boy might take of cunas and pinnocks and such delicate fish at the ship's stern more than six or ten can eat in a day but with a casting net thousands when we pleased and scarce any place but cod cusk hollybut mackerel skate or such like a man may take with a hook or line what he will and in diverse sandy bays a man may draw with a net great store of mullets bases and diverse other sorts of such excellent fish as many as his net can draw on shore no river where there is not plenty of sturgeon or salmon or both all which are to be had in abundance observing but their seasons but if a man will go at christmas to gather cherries in kent he may be deceived though there be plenty in summer so here these plenties have their seasons as i have expressed we for the most part had little but bread and vinegar and though the most part of july when the fishing decayed they wrought all day lay abroad in the isles all night and lived on what they found yet were not sick but i would wish none put himself long to such plunges except necessity constrain it yet worthy is that person to starve that here cannot live if he have sense strength and health for there is no such penury of these blessings in any place but that a hundred men may in one hour or two make their provisions for a day and he that hath experience to manage well these affairs with forty or thirty honest industrious men might well undertake if they dwell in these parts to subject the salvages and feed daily two or three hundred men with as good corn fish and flesh as the earth hath of those kinds and yet make that labour but their pleasure provided that they have engines that be proper for their purposes a note for men that have great spirits and small means who can desire more content that hath small means or but only his merit to advance his fortune then to tread and plant that ground he hath purchased by the hazard of his life if he have but the taste of virtue and magnanimity what to such a mind can be more pleasant than planting and building a foundation for his posterity got from the rude earth by god's blessing and his own industry without prejudice to any if he have any grain of faith or zeal in religion what can he do less hurtful to any or more agreeable to god than to seek to convert those poor salvages to know christ and humanity whose labours with discretion will triple requite thy charge and pains what so truly suits with honour and honesty as the discovering things unknown, erecting towns peopling countries informing the ignorant reforming things unjust teaching virtue and gain to our nature mother country a kingdom to attend her find employment for those that are idle because they can know not what to do so far from wronging any as to cause posterity to remember thee and remembering thee ever honour that remembrance with praise consider what were the beginnings and endings of the monarchies of the chaldeans the syrians the grecians and the romanus but this one rule what was it they would not do for the good of the commonwealth or their mother city for example rome what made her such a monarchess but only the adventures of her youth not in riots at home but in dangers abroad on the justice and judgment out to their experience when they grew aged what was their ruin and hurt but this the excess of idleness the fondness of parents 
the want of experience in magistrates, the admiration of their undeserved honours, the contempt of true merit, their unjust jealousies, their politic incredulities, their hypocritical seeming goodness, and their deeds of secret lewdness, finally, in fine, growing only formal temperists, all that their predecessors got in many years, they lost in few days. Those by their pains and virtues became lords of the world. They, by their ease and vices, became slaves to their servants. This is the difference betwixt the use of arms in the field and on the monuments of stones, the golden age and the leaden age, prosperity and misery, justice and corruption, substance and shadows, words and deeds, experience and imagination, making commonwealths and marrying commonwealths, the fruits of virtue and the conclusions of vice. Then, who would live at home idly, or think in himself any worth to live, only to eat, drink, and sleep, and so die? Or by consuming that carelessly, his friends got worthily? Or by using that miserably, that maintained virtue honestly? For, being descended nobly, pine with the vain vaunt of great kindred in penury, or to maintain a silly show of bravery, toil out thy heart, soul, and time, basely by shifts, tricks, cards, and dice, or by relating news of others' actions, shark here or there for a dinner or supper, deceive thy friends by fair promises and dissimulation in borrowing where thou never intendest to pay, Offend the laws, surfeit with excess, burden thy country, abuse thyself, despair in want, and then cousin thy kindred, yea, even thine own brother, and wish thy parents death, I will not say damnation, to have their estates, though thou seest what honours and rewards the world yet hath for them will seek them, and worthily deserve them. I would be sorry to offend, or that any should mistake my honest meaning, for I wish good to all, hurt to none. But rich men, for the most part, are grown to that dotage through their pride in their wealth, as though there were no accident could end it or their life. And what hellish care do such take to make it their own misery and their country's spoil, especially when there is most need of their employment? drawing by all manner of inventions from the prince and his honest subjects even the vital spirits of their powers and estates, as if their bags or brags were so powerful a defence the malicious could not assault them, when they are the only bait to cause us not to be only assaulted, but betrayed and murdered in our own security, ere we well perceive it. An example of secure covetousness. May not the miserable ruin of Constantinople, their impregnable Wallace, riches and pleasures last taken by the Turk, which are but a bit in comparison of their now mightiness, remember us of the effects of private covetousness? At which time the good emperor held himself rich enough to have such rich subjects so formal in all excess of vanity, all kind of delicacy and prodigality, his poverty when the Turks besieged, the citizens whose merchandising thoughts were only to get wealth, little conceiving the desperate resolution of a valiant expert enemy, left the emperor so long to his conclusions, having spent all he had to pay his young, raw, disconsented soldiers, and suddenly he, they, and their city were all a prey to the devouring Turk, and what they would not spare for the maintenance of them who had ventured their lives to defend them, did serve only their enemies to torment them, their friends, and country, and old Christendom to this present day. Let this lamentable example remember you that are rich, seeing there are such great thieves in the world to rob you, 
not good to lend some proportion to breed them that have little yet willing to learn how to defend you for it is too late when the deed is a doing the romanus estate hath been worse than this for the mere covetousness and extortion of a few of them so move the rest that not having any employment but contemplation their great judgments grew to so great malice as themselves were sufficient to destroy themselves by faction let this move you to embrace employment for those whose educations spirits and judgments want but your purses not only to prevent such accustomed dangers but also to gain more thereby than you have and you fathers that are either so foolishly fond or so miserably covetous or so wilfully ignorant or so negligently careless as that you would rather maintain your children in idle wantonness till they grow your masters or become so basely unkind as they wish nothing but your deaths so that both sorts go dissolute and although you would wish them anywhere to escape the gallows and ease your cares though they spend you here one two or three hundred pound a year you would grudge them to give half so much in adventure with them to obtain an estate which in a small time but with a little assistance of your providence might be better than your own but if an angel should tell you that any place yet unknown can afford such fortunes you would not believe him no more than columbus was believed there was any such land as is now the well-known abounding america much less such large regions are yet unknown as well in america as in africa and asia and terra incognita where were courses for gentlemen and them that would be so reputed more suiting their qualities than begging from their prince's generous disposition the labours of his subjects and the very marrow of his maintenance the author's conditions i have not been so ill-bred but i have tasted of plenty and pleasure as well as want and misery nor doth necessity yet nor occasion of discontent force me to these endeavours nor am i ignorant what small thank i shall have for my pains or that many would have the world imagine them to be of great judgment that can but blemish these my designers by their witty objections and detractions yet i hope my reasons with my deeds will so prevail with some that i shall not want employment in these affairs to make the most blind see his own senselessness and incredulity hoping that gain will make them effect that which religion charity and the common good cannot it were but a poor device in me to deceive myself much more the king and state my friends and country with these inducements which seeing his majesty hath given permission i wish all sorts of worthy honest industrious spirits would understand and if they desire any further satisfaction i will do my best to give it not to persuade them to go only but go with them not leave them there but live with them there i will not say but by ill providing and undue managing such courses may be taken may make us miserable enough but if i have the execution of what i have projected if they want to eat let them eat or never digest me if i perform what i say i desire but that reward out of the gainers may suit my pains quality and condition and if i abuse you with my tongue take my heed for satisfaction if any dislike at the year's end defraying their charge by my consent they should freely return i fear not want of company sufficient were it but canoe what i can know of these countries and by the proof of that wealth i hope yearly to return if god please to bless me from such accidents as are beyond my power in reason to prevent for i am not so simple to think 
that ever any other motive than wealth will ever erect there a commonweal, or draw company from their ease and humorous at home to stay in New England to effect my purposes. The planters, pleasures, and profits unless any should think the toil might be insupportable though these things may be had by labour and diligence i assure myself there are who delight extremely in vain pleasure that take much more pains in england to enjoy it than i should do here to gain wealth sufficient and yet i think they should not have half such sweet content for our pleasure here is still gains in england charges and loss here nature and liberty affords us that freely which in england we want or it costeth us dearly what pleasure can be had then being tired with any occasion ashore in planting vines fruits or herbs in contriving their own grounds to the pleasure of their own minds their fields gardens orchards buildings ships and other works etc to recreate themselves before their own doors in their own boats upon the sea where a man woman and child with a small hook and line by angling may take diverse sorts of excellent fish at their pleasures and is it not pretty sport to pull up two pence sixpence and twelve pence as fast as you can hail and veer a line he is a very bad fisher, cannot kill in one day with his hook and line one, two, or three hundred cods, which, dressed and dried, if they be sold there for ten shillings the hundred, though in England they will give more than twenty, may not both the servant, the master, and merchant be well content with this gain? If a man work but three days in seven, he may get more than he can spend, unless he will be excessive. Now that carpenter, mason, gardener, tailor, smith, sailor, forges, or what other, may they not make this a pretty recreation, though they fish but an hour in a day, to take more than they eat in a week? Or if they will not eat it, because there is so much better choice, yet sell it or change it with the fishermen or merchants for anything they want and what sport doth yield a more pleasing content and less hurt and charge them than angling with a hook and crossing the sweet air from isle to isle over the silent streams of a calm sea wherein the most curious may find pleasure profit and content thus though all men be not fishers yet all men whatsoever may in other matters do as well for necessity doth in these cases so rule a commonwealth and each in their several functions as their labours in their qualities may be as profitable because there is a necessary mutual use of all employments for gentlemen for gentlemen what exercise should more delight them than ranging daily those unknown parts using fowling and fishing for hunting and hawking and yet you shall see the wild hawks give you some pleasure in seeing them stoop six or seven after one another an hour or two together at the skulls of the fish in the fair harbours as those ashore at a fowl and never trouble nor torment yourselves with watching, mewing, feeding, and attending them. Nor kill horse and man with running and crying, see you not a hawk? For hunting also, the woods, lakes, and rivers afford not only cheese sufficient for any that delights in that kind of toil or pleasure, but beasts to hunt, that besides the delicacy of their bodies for food, their skins are so rich as may recompense thy daily labour with a captain's pay. Employments for labourers For labourers, if those that sow hemp, rape, turnips, parsnips, carrots, cabbage, and such like, give twenty, thirty, forty, fifty shillings yearly for an acre of ground, and meat, drink, and wages to use it, and yet grow rich when better 
or at least as good ground, may be had and cost nothing but labour. It seems strange to me that he such should there grow poor. My purpose is not to persuade children from their parents, men from their wives, nor servants from their masters, only such as with free consent may be spared, but that each parish or village in city or country that will but apparel their fatherless children of thirteen or fourteen years of age, or young married people that have small wealth to live on, here by their labour may live exceeding well, provided always that first there be sufficient power to command them, houses to receive them, means to defend them, and meet provisions for them. For any place may be overlain, and it is most necessary to have a fortress, ere this grow to practice, and sufficient masters, as carpenters, masons, fishers, fowlers, gardeners, husbandmen, sawyers, smiths, spinsters, tailors, weavers, and such like, to take ten, twelve, or twenty, or, as there is occasion, for apprentices. The masters, by this, may quickly grow rich. These may learn their trades themselves, to do the like, to a general and an incredible benefit for king and country, master and servant. Examples of the Spaniard It would be a history of a large volume to recite the adventures of the Spaniards and Portugals, their affronts and defeats, their dangers and miseries, which, with such incomparable honour and constant resolution, so far beyond belief, they have attempted and endured in their discoveries and plantations, as may well condemn us of too much imbecility, sloth, and negligence. Yet the authors of those new inventions were held as ridiculous for a long time, as now are others that do but seek to imitate their unparalleled virtues. And though we see daily their mountains of wealth sprung from the plants of their generous endeavours, yet is our sensuality and untowardness such, and so great, that we either ignorantly believe nothing, or so curiously contest to prevent we can know not what future events, that we either so neglect or oppress or discourage the present, as we spoil all in the making, crop all in the blooming, and building upon fair sand, rather than rough rocks, judge that we know not, govern that we have not, fear that which is not, and for fear some should do too well, force such against their wills to be idle or as ill. And who is he hath judgment, courage, and any industry or quality with understanding will leave his country, his hopes at home, his certain estate, his friends, pleasures, liberty, and the preferment sweet England doth afford to all degrees, were it not to advance his fortunes by enjoying his deserts, whose prosperity once appearing will encourage others, but it must be cherished as a child till it be able to go and understand itself, and not corrected nor oppressed above its strength, ere it can know wherefore. A child can neither perform the office nor deeds of a man of strength, nor endure that affliction he is able, nor can an apprentice at the first perform the part of a meister, and if twenty years be required to make a child a man, seven years limited an apprentice for his trade, if scarce an age be sufficient to make a wise man or a statesman, and, commonly, a man dies ere he hath learned to be discreet, if perfection be so hard to be obtained, as of necessity there must be practice as well as theoric, let no man much condemn this paradox opinion to say that have seven years is scarce sufficient, for a good capacity to learn in these affairs how to carry himself. And whoever shall try in these remote places the erecting of a colony, shall find at the end of seven years occasion enough to use all his discretion, and in the interim all the content, rewards, gains, 
and hopes will be necessarily required to be given to the beginning till it be able to creep to stand and go a time enough to keep it from running for there is no fear it will grow too fast or ever to anything except liberty profit honour and prosperity there found more bind the planters of those affairs in devotion to affect it than bondage violence tyranny ingratitude and such double dealing as binds free men to become slaves and honest men turn knaves which hath ever been the ruin of most popular commonweals and is very unlikely ever well to begin in anew the bliss of spain who seeth not what is the greatest good of the spaniard but these new conclusions in searching those unknown parts of this unknown world by which means he dives even into the very secret of all his neighbours and for the most part of the world when the portugalia and spaniard found the east and west indies how many did condemn themselves that did not accept of that honest offer of noble columbus who upon our neglect brought them to it persuading ourselves the world had no such places as they had found and yet ever since we find they still from time to time have found new lands new nations and trades and still daily do find both in asia africa terra incognita and america so that there is neither soldier nor mechanic from the lord to the beggar but those parts afford them all employment and discharge their native soil of so many thousands of all sorts that else by their sloth pride and imperfections would long ere this have troubled their neighbours or have eaten the pride of spain itself now he knows little that knows not england may well spare many more people than spain and is as well able to furnish them with all manner of necessaries and seeing for all they have they cease not still to search for that which they have not and can know not it is strange we should be so dull as not maintain that which we have and pursue that which we can know surely i am sure many would taste it ill to be abridged of the titles and honours of their predecessors when if but truly they would judge themselves look how inferior they are to their noble virtues so much they are unworthy of their honours and livings which never were ordained for shows and shadows to maintain idleness and vice but to make them more able to abound in honour by heroical deeds of action judgment piety and virtue what was it they would not do both in purse and person for the good of the commonwealth which might move them presently to set out their spare kindred in these generous designs religion above all things should move us especially the clergy if we were religious to show our faith by our works in converting those poor salvages to the knowledge of god seeing what pains the spaniard take to bring them to their adulterated faith honour might move the gentry the valiant and industrious and the hope and assurance of wealth all if we were that we would seem and be accounted or be we so inferior to other nations or our spirits so far dejected from our ancient predecessors or our minds so upon spoil piracy and such villainy as to serve the portugal spaniard dutch french or turk as to the cost of europe too many do rather than our god our king our country and ourselves excusing our idleness and our base complaints by want of employment when here is such choice of all sorts and for all degrees in the planting and discovering these north parts of america end of section four a description of new england part three Recording by Algie Pug
Section five of a description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five a description of New England. Part four. My second voyage to New England. No, to make my words more apparent by my deeds, I was the last year sixteen fifteen to have stayed in the country to make a more ample trial of those conclusions with sixteen men whose names were Thomas Dearmer, gentleman, Edward Stallings, gentleman, Daniel Cage, gentleman. Francis Abbott, gentleman, John Gosling, gentleman, William Ingram, soldier, Robert Meter, soldier, David Cooper, soldier, John Partridge, soldier, and two boys, Thomas Digby, sailor, Daniel Baker, sailor, Adam Smith, sailor, Thomas Watson, sailor, Walter Chiswick, sailor, John Hall, sailor. I confess I could have wished them as many thousands had all the provisions been in like proportion, nor would I have had so few could I have had means for more. Yet would God have pleased we had safely arrived I had never the like authority, freedom, and provision to do so well. The main assistance, next God, I had to this small number was my acquaintance among the salvages, especially with Dobanida, one of their greatest lords, who had lived long in England. By means of this proud salvage, I did not doubt but quickly to have got that credit with the rest of his friends and alliance, to have had as many of them as I desired in any designs I intended. And that trade also they had by such a kind of exchange of their country commodities, which both with ease and security in their seasons may be used. With him and divers others I had concluded to inhabit and defend them against the Tarentines, with a better power than the French did them whose tyranny did enforce them to embrace my offer with no small devotion. And though many may think me more bold than wise in regard of their power, dexterity, treachery, and inconstancy, having so desperately assaulted and betrayed many others, I say but this, because with so many I have many times done much more in Virginia than I intended here, when I wanted that experience Virginia taught me, that to me it seems no danger more than ordinary. And though I know myself the meanest of many thousands, whose apprehensive inspection can pierce beyond the bounds of my abilities into the hidden things of nature, art, and reason, yet I entreat such give me leave to excuse myself of so much imbecility, as to say that in these eight years which I have been conversant with these affairs, I have not learned there is a great difference betwixt the directions and judgment of experimental knowledge and the superficial conjecture of variable relation, wherein rumour, humour, or misprision have such power that oft one, that oft times one is enough to beguile twenty, but twenty not sufficient to keep one from being deceived. Therefore I know no reason but to believe my own eyes before any man's imagination, that is, but rested from the conceits of my own projects and endeavours. But I honour with all affection the counsel and instructions of judicial directions, or any other honest advertisement so far to observe as they tie me not to the cruelty of unknown events. These are the inducements that drew me to neglect all other employments 
and to spend my time and best abilities in these adventures, wherein, though I have had many discouragements by the ingratitude of some, the malicious slanders of others, the falseness of friends, the treachery of cowards, and slowness of adventurers, but chiefly by one hunt, who was master of the ship, with whom oft arguing these projects for a plantation, however he seemed well in words to like it, yet he practised to have robbed me of my plots and observations, and so left me alone in a desolate isle to the fury of famine and all other extremities, lest I should have acquainted Sir Thomas Smith, my honourable good friend, and the council of Virginia, to the end he and his associates might secretly engross it, ere it were known to the state. Yet that God that hath always kept me from the worst of such practices, delivered me from the worst of his dissimulations. Notwithstanding, after my departure, he abused the salvages where he came, and betrayed twenty-seven of these poor innocent souls, which he sold in Spain for slaves, to move their heat against our nation, as well as to cause my proceedings to be so much the more difficult. Now, returning in the bark, in the fifth of August, I arrived at Plymouth, where, imparting those my purposes to my honourable friend, Sir Ferdinando Gorge, and some others, I was so encouraged and assured to have them managing their authority in those parts during my life, that I engaged myself to undertake it for them. Arriving at London, I found also many promised me such assistance, that I entertained Michael Cooper, the master, who returned with me, and others of the company. How he dealt with others, or others with him, I can know not. But my public proceeding gave such encouragement, that it became so well apprehended by some few of the southern company, as these projects were liked, and he furnished from London with four ships at sea, before they at Plymouth had made any provision at all, but only a ship chiefly set out by Sir Ferdinando Gorge, which upon Hunt's late treachery among the salvages returned as she went, and did little or nothing but lost her time. I must confess, I was beholden to the setters forth of the four ships that went with Cooper, and that they offered me that employment, if I would accept it, and I find my refusal hath incurred some of their displeasures, whose favour and love I exceedingly desire, if I may honestly enjoy it. And though they do censure me as opposite to their proceedings, they shall yet still in all my words and deeds find, it is their error, not my fault, that occasions their dislike, for having engaged myself in this business to the West Country, I had been very dishonest to have broke my promise, nor will I spend more time in discovery or fishing till I may go with a company for plantation, for I know my grounds. Yet every one that reads this book cannot put it in practice, though it may help any that have seen those parts, and though they endeavour to work me even out of my own designs, I will not much envy their fortunes, but I would be sorry their intruding ignorance should, by their defilements, bring those certainties to doubtfulness, so that the business prosper I have my desire, be it by Londoner, Scot, Welch, or English, that are true subjects to our king and country. The good of my country is that I seek, and there is more than enough for all, if they could be content but to proceed. THE OCCASION OF MY RETURN at last did please Sir Ferdinando Garge and Master Dr. Sutliff, Dean of Exeter, to conceive so well of these projects and my former employments, as induced them to make a new adventure with me in those parts, whither they have so often sent to their continual loss, by whose example many inhabitants of the West Country, 
made promises of much more than was looked for but their private emulations quickly qualified that heat in the greater number so that the burden lay principally on them and some few gentlemen my friends in london in the end i was furnished with a ship of two hundred and another of fifty my re-embarkment encounters with pirates and imprisonment by the french but ere i had sailed a hundred and twenty leagues she broke all her masts pumping each watch five or six thousand strokes only her spread sail remained to spoon before the wind till we had re-accommodated a jury mast and the rest to return for plymouth my vice-admiral being lost not knowing of this proceeded her voyage now with the remainder of those provisions i got out again in a small bark of sixty tons with thirty men for this of two hundred and provision for seventy which were the sixteen before named and fourteen other sailors for the ship with those i set sail again the twenty-fourth of june where what befell me because my actions and writings are so public to the world envy still seeking to scandalize my endeavors and seeing no power but death can stop the chat of ill tongues nor imagination of men's minds lest my own relations of those hard events might by some constructors be made doubtful i have thought it best to insert the examinations of those proceedings taken by sir lewis stukeley a worthy knight and vice-admiral of devonshire which were as followeth the examination of daniel baker late steward to captain john smith in the return of plymouth taken before sir lewis stukeley knight the eighth of december sixteen fifteen captain fry his ship a hundred and forty tons thirty-six cast pieces and murderers eighty men of which forty or fifty were master gunners who seeth being chased two days by one fry an english pirate that could not board us by reason of foul weather edmund chambers the master john minter his mate thomas digby the pilot and others importuned his said captain to yield holding it impossible he should defend himself and that the said captain should send them his boat in that they had none which at last he concluded upon these conditions that fry the pirate should vow not to take anything from captain smith that might overthrow his voyage nor send more pirates into his ship than he liked off otherwise he would make sure of them he had and defend himself against the rest as he could more he confesseth that the quartermasters and chambers received gold of those pirates but how much he knoweth not nor would his captain come out of his cabin to entertain them although a great many of them had been his sailors and for his love would have wafted us to the isles of flowers the one of two hundred the other twenty at foil we were chased by two french pirates who commanded us amain chambers minter digby and others importuned again the captain to yield alleging they were turks and would make them all slaves or frenchmen and would throw them all overboard if they shot but a piece on that they were entertained to fish and not to fight until the captain vowed to fire the powder and split the ship if they would not stand to their defence whereby at last we went clear of them for all they shot the admiral a hundred and forty tons twelve pieces twelve murderers ninety men with long pistols pocket pistols musket sword and poignard the vice admiral hundred tons the rear admiral sixty the others eighty all had two hundred and fifty men most armed as is said 
at flowers we were chased by four french men of war all with their close fights afore and after after this examinance captain having provided for our defence chambers minter digby and some others again importuned him to yield to the favour of those against whom there was nothing but ruin by fighting but if he would go aboard them in that he would speak french by courtesy he might go clear seeing they offered him such fair quarter and vowed they were protestants and all of rochelle and had the king's commission only to take spaniards portugales and pirates which at last he did but they kept this examinate's captain and some other of his company with him the next day the french men of war went aboard us and took what they listed and divided the company into their several ships and manned this examinate's ship with the frenchmen and chased with her all the ships they saw until about five or six days after upon better consideration they surrendered the ship and victuals with the most part of our provision but not our weapons the gentlemen and soldiers were ever willing to fight more he confesseth that his captain exhorted them to perform their voyage or go for new found land to return frotted with fish where he would find means to proceed in his plantation but chambers and minter grew upon terms they would not until those that were soldiers concluded with their captain's resolution they would seeing they had clothes victuals salt nets and line sufficient and expected their arms and such other things as they wanted the french promised to restore which the captain the next day went to seek and sent them about loading of commodities as powder match hooks instruments his sword and dagger bedding aquavitae his commission apparel and many other things the particulars he remembereth not but as for the cloth canoes and the captain's clothes chambers and his associates divided it amongst themselves and to whom they best liked his captain not having anything to his good knowledge but his waistcoat and breeches and in this manner going from ship to ship to regain our arms and the rest they seeing a sail gave chase until night the next day being very foul weather this examinate came so near with the ship unto the french men of war that they split the main sail on the other's spread sail yard chambers willed the captain come aboard or he would leave him whereupon the captain commanded chambers to send his boat for him chambers replied she was split which was false telling him he might come if he would in the admiral's boat the captain's answer was he could not command her nor come when he would so this examinant fell upon stern and that night left his said captain alone amongst the frenchmen in this manner by the command of chambers minter and others daniel cage edward stallings gentlemen walter chiswick david cooper robert miller and john partridge being examined do acknowledge and confess that daniel baker his examination above written is true a double treachery now the cause why the french detained me again was the suspicion this chambers and minter gave them that i would revenge myself upon the bank or a new found land of all the french i could there encounter and how i would have fired the ship had they not over persuaded me and many other such like tricks to catch but opportunity in this manner of leave me and thus they returned to plymouth and perforce with the french i thus proceeded a fleet of nine french men of war and fights with the spaniards being a fleet of eight or nine sail we watch for the west indies fleet till ill weather separated us from the other eight still we spent our time about the isles near file where to keep my perplexed thoughts from too much meditation of my miserable estate i writ this discourse thinking to have it sent you of his majesty's counsel by some ship or other 
for I saw their purpose was to take all they could. At last we were chased by one Captain Burra, an English pirate, in a small ship, with some twelve pieces of ordnance, about thirty men, and near all starved. They sought, by courtesy, relief of us, who gave them such fair promises, as at last we betrayed Captain Wollaston, his lieutenant, and four or five of their men aboard us, and then provided to take the rest per force. Now my part was to be prisoner in the gun-room, and not to speak to any of them upon my life. Yet had Barra knowledge what I was. Then Barra, perceiving well these French intents, made ready to fight, and Wollaston as resolutely regarded not their threats, which gave us to Moore upon the matter longer, some sixteen hours, and then returned their prisoners, and some victuals also, upon a small composition. The next we took was a small English man of pool from Newfoundland. The great cabin at this present was my prison, from whence I could see them pillage those poor men of all that they had, and half their fish. When he was gone, they sold his poor clothes at the main mast by an outcry, which scarce gave each man seven pence apiece. Not long after, we took a Scot fraught from St. Michael's to Bristol. He had better fortune than the other, for, having but taken a boat-loading of sugar, marmalade, suckets, and such like, we descried four sail after whom we stood, who, foiling their mainsails, attended us to fight. But our French spirits were content only to perceive they were English red crosses. Within a very small time after, we chased four Spanish ships, came from the Indies, we fought with them four or five hours, tore their sails and sides, yet not daring to board them, lost them. A prize worth sixteen thousand crowns. A poor Carul of Brasile was the next we chased, and, after a small fight, thirteen or fourteen of our men being wounded, which was the better half, we took her with three hundred and seventy chests of sugar. A prize worth two hundred thousand crowns. The next was a West Indies man of a hundred and sixty tons, with twelve hundred hides, fifty chests of cuchinel, fourteen coffers of wedges of silver, eight thousand riles of eight, and six coffers of the king of Spain's treasure, besides the pillage and rich coffers of many rich passengers. Two months they kept me in this manner to manage their fights against the Spaniards, and be a prisoner when they took any English. Now, though the captain had oft broke his promise, which was to put me ashore on the isles, or the next ship be took, yet at last he was entreated I should go for France in the caruel of sugar, himself resolved still to keep the seas. Within two days after, we were hailed by two West Indiamen, but when they saw us wave them for the King of France, they gave us their broadsides, shot through our main mast, and so left us. Having lived thus near three months amongst those French men of war, with much ado we arrived at the Gouleon, not far from Rochelle, where, instead of the great promises they always fed me with, of double satisfaction and full content, they kept me five or six days prisoner in the Carol, accusing me to be him that burnt their colony in New France, to force me give them a discharge before the judge of the admiralty, and so stand to their courtesy for satisfaction, or lie in prison, or a worse mischief. My escape from the Frenchman To prevent this choice, in the end of such a storm, that beat them all under hatches, I watched my opportunity to get ashore in their boat, whereinto, in the dark night, I secretly got, and with a half-pike that lay by me, put a drift for the rat isle. But the current was so strong, and the sea so great, I went adrift to sea, till it pleased God, the wind so turned with the tide, that, although I was all this fearful night of gusts and rain, in the sea, the space of twelve hours, when many ships were driven ashore, and diverse split, and being with schooling and bailing the water tired, 
I expected each minute would sink me. At last I arrived in an oozy isle by Sharone, where certain fowlers found me near drowned and half dead, with water, cold, and hunger. By those I found means to get to Rochelle, where I understood the man of war which we left at sea, and the rich prize was split, the captain drowned, and half his company the same night. Within seven leagues of that place, from whence I escaped alone in the little boat by the mercy of God, far beyond all men's reason or my expectation. Arriving at Rochelle, upon my complaint to the judge of the admiralty, I found many good words and fair promises, and ere long many of them that escaped drowning told me the news they heard of my own death. These, I arresting, their several examinations, did so confirm my complaint. It was held proof sufficient. Sir Thomas Edmonds All which being performed according to the order of justice from under the judge's hand, I presented it to the English ambassador then at Bordeaux, where it was my chance to see the arrival of the king's great marriage brought from Spain. Of the ruck of the rich prize, some thirty-six thousand crowns worth of goods came ashore, and was saved with the carol, which I did my best to arrest. The judge did promise me I should have justice. What will be the conclusion as yet, I know not. They betrayed me, having the broad seal of England, and near twenty sail of English more, besides them concealed, in like manner were betrayed that year. But under the colour to take pirates and West Indiemen, because the Spaniards will not suffer the French trade in the West Indies, any goods from thence, though they take them upon the coast of Spain, a lawful prize, or from any of his territories out of the limits of Europe. My return for England, 1615. Leaving this my business in France, I returned to Plymouth to find them that had thus buried me amongst the French, and not only buried me, but with so much infamy as such treacherous cowards could suggest to excuse their villainies. But my clothes, books, instruments, arms, and what I had, they shared amongst them, and what they liked, Feening the French had all was wanting, and had thrown them into the sea, taken their ship, and all, had they not run away and left me, as they did. The chieftains of this mutiny that I could find, I laid by the heels. The rest, like themselves, confessed the truth, as you have heard. Now how I have, or could, prevent these accidents, I rest at your censures. But to the matter. New found land at the first, I have heard, was held as desperate a fishing as this I project in New England, Placentia, and the bank, were also as doubtful to the French. But, for all the disasters happened me, the business is the same it was, and the five ships, whereof one was reported more than three hundred tons, went forward, and found fish so much that neither Iceland man nor Newfoundland man I could hear of hath been there, will go any more to either place, if they may go thither. The success of my vice-admiral and the four ships of London from New England. So, that upon the return of my vice-admiral, that proceeded on her voyage, when I spent my masts, from Plymouth this year are gone four or five sail and from London as many, only to make voyages of profit, where the Englishmen have yet been all their returns together, except Sir Francis Popamus, would scarce make one a savour of near a dozen I could nominate, though there be fish sufficient, as I persuade myself, to fraught yearly four or five hundred sail, or as many as will go. For this fishing stretcheth along the coast, from Cape Cod to Newfoundland, which is seven or eight hundred miles at the least, and hath his course in the deeps, and by the shore, all the year long. 
keeping their hunts and feedings as the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. But all men are not such as they should be, that have undertaken those voyages, and a man that hath but heard of an instrument can hardly use it so well as he that by use hath contrived to make it. All are Romanus were not Scipios, nor all the Genoeses Columbuses, nor all Spaniards Corteses. Had they dived no deeper in the secrets of their discoveries than we, or stopped at such doubts and poor accidental chances, they had never been remembered as they are, yet had they no such certainties to begin as we. But, to conclude, Adam and Eve did first begin this innocent work, to plant the earth to remain to posterity. But not without labour, trouble, and industry, Noah and his family began again the second plantation, and their seed, as it still increased, hath still planted new countries, and one country another, and so the world to that estate it is. But not without much hazard, travel, discontents, and many disasters. Had those worthy fathers and their memorable offspring not been more diligent for us now in these ages than we are to plant that yet unplanted for the after-livers, had the seed of Abraham, our Saviour Christ, and his apostles had exposed themselves to no more dangers to teach the gospel and the will of God than we, even we ourselves, had at this present been as salvage and as miserable as the most barbarous salvage yet uncivilized. The Hebrews and Lacedaemonians, the Goths, the Grecians, the Romanus, and the rest, what was it they would not undertake to enlarge their territories, enrich their subjects, resist their enemies? Those that were the founders of those great monarchies and their virtues were no silvered, idle, golden Pharisees, but industrious, iron-steeled publicans. They regarded more provisions and necessaries for their people than jewels, riches, ease, or delight for themselves. Riches were their servants, not their maesters. They ruled as fathers, not as tyrants, their people as children, not as slaves. There was no disaster could discourage them, and let none think they encountered not with all manner of encumbrances, and what have ever been the works of the greatest princes of the earth, but planting of countries, and civilizing barbarous and inhumane nations, to civility and humanity, whose eternal axioms fill our histories. Lastly, the Portugales and Spaniards, whose ever-living actions before our eyes will testify with them our idleness, and ingratitude to all posterities, and the neglect of our duties in our piety and religion we owe our God, our King, and country, and of want charity to those poor salvages whose country we challenge, use, and possess, except we be but made to use and mar what our forefathers made, or but only tell what they did, or esteem ourselves too good to take the like pains. Was it virtue in them to provide that doth maintain us, and baseness for us to do the like for others? Surely, no. Then, seeing we are not born for ourselves, but each to help other, and our abilities are much alike at the hour of our birth, and the minute of our death, seeing our good deeds, or our bad, by faith in Christ's merits, is all we have to carry our souls to heaven, or hell, seeing honour is our lives' ambition, and our ambition after death, to have an honourable memory of our life, and seeing by no means we could be abated of the dignities and glories of our predecessors, let us imitate their virtues to be worthily their successors. Finis At London, printed the 18th of June, in the year of our Lord, 1616. End of section 5. A description of New England. Part 4. Recording by Algie Pug.
A Description of New England by Captain John Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6 Testimonial Verses Closing Set To his worthy captain, the author. Oft thou hast led, when I brought up the rear in bloody wars, where thousands have been slain. Then give me leave, in this some part to bear, and, as thy servant, here to read my name. Tis true, long time thou hast my captain been in the fierce wars of Transylvania, long ere that thou America hadst seen, or led wast captive in Virginia. Thou that to pass the world's four parts dost deem no more than twere to go to bed or drink, and all that thou yet hast done thou dost esteem as nothing. This does cause me think that thou I have seen so oft approved in dangers, and thrice captive thy valour still hath freed, art yet preserved to convert those strangers. By God thy guide, I trust it is decreed. For me I not commend, but much admire thy England yet unknown to passers by her, for it will praise itself in spite of me. Thou it, it thou, to all posterity. Your true friend and so dear, Edward Robinson. To my honest captain, the author. Malignant times, what can be said or done, but shall be censured and traduced by some? This worthy work, which thou hast bought so dear, nay thou nor it detractors need to fear. Thy words by deeds so long thou hast approved, of thousands know thee not, thou art beloved. And this great plot will make thee ten times more canon and beloved than e'er thou wert before. I never knew a warrior yet but thee, from wine, tobacco, debts, dice, oaths so free. I call thee warrior, and I make the bolder, for many a captain now was ne'er so dear. Some such may swell at this, but to their praise, when they have done like thee, my muse shall raise their due deserts to worthies yet to come, to live like thine admired, till day of doom. Your true friend, sometimes your soldier, Thomas Carlton. End of section 6. Testimonial verses. Closing set. End of a description of New England by Captain John Smith. Recording by Algie Pug.